Yes, you too. Good afternoon. I hear you. I hear you. Good afternoon. I can hear okay. you guys. I can hear you guys. Oh, thank you guys. Um, so I'm just going to show my face for just a brief um this thing. I'm very camera shy. So um good afternoon, everyone. As Dapo mentioned, my name is Yetinde Salau. Um, I'm a project manager. I currently work with Abzone Group. And I've been a project manager for six, seven years and focused entirely in the IT space, um, software space. Um, but this session is not about me. It's about you guys. And um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Earlier during the week, I know we have um, maybe guys that are not from the um, Discord, the non Discord channel. So I'll try to like, get everybody on the same level. Earlier during the week, we shared um, the handouts for this course, and then this would happen over the next one week. Um, we have groups, you've all been paired into groups, and then you have tasks that you have to work on. So I'll be spending the first 30 minutes or so just touching on certain key points on project management and then we go into the tax we try to do some on the call and then you have to do um, the other ones with your group members and then at the end of next week we would have a presentation where you have to come and then present your um your tax um the tax is to build um a product um and then have your backlog and have your scrum events and all that. So come back and have that session um, that will communicate that. So that's just for introduction. Um, Discord link. So I think that is going to answer any question as related to, to Discord and anyone that's interested in the mentorship session, but um, I'll just go ahead and share my screen and also stop sharing my video. Another thing is this class is supposed to be interactive. So feel free to drop your questions. Feel free to raise up your hand or mute your mic and ask questions. We're going to be having interactive sessions. We're going to be asking questions. We're going to be working on um, make-believe products and all that. So please do not go quiet on me. Um, I require feedback um, during my sessions. So right ahead to share my screen and then we can kick start. So just give me a thumbs up in the chat session if you are together and you got all I, I just said. Thumbs up guys. Thank you. So we have um, 29 people. Uh, we'll be expecting more terms of. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so we'll just go straight to it. Do confirm if you can see my screen. Um, can we see my screen, please? Yes, it's uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to hear those lovely voices. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, requesting remote control of my screen. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, we're going to be talking about like um that were mentioned the principles of project management in progress, in progress, progress, progress. okay sorry about that so we're going to be talking about the principles of project management in software engineering um most of the time, a lot of people ask these questions. Um, do we have project managers in software companies, especially companies that are product focused? Um, you have project managers in consulting companies, you have project managers in 
um, the non-IT fields. And then in recent times, if, when we had the shift towards Agile, you have most um, product-led organizations not having project managers, and they have what we call product managers. And then, but in recent times, we've been seeing a shift because uh, most companies are now realizing the need to have project managers, even in product-led organizations, and the need to have um, the, the entire organization matured in project management methodology. methodology. So we're going to be talking today about, uh, what is that line? Dapo, can you please confirm if you can still see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so just give me a minute. Zoom is asking for permission to access my screen. Just need to give that permission. Okay, we're back. So today we're going to be talking about Scrum. Um, in in products or using agile method, we what we use is Scrum. Um, the days of waterfall methodology are way past. So we're going to be talking about Scrum. We're going to be talking about the Scrum event. We're also going to be doing some, like I said, some um, hands-on um, activities, practical use of of Scrum articles. We're also going to be breaking down, starting from having a product idea and then breaking it down into a more detailed to do list and releasing a product, and then also different rules. So these are the things that we'll be talking about very quickly. And the first thing I want us to know is to clear our mind. Um, I I'm not sure we even have project managers in this call. I know maybe some people joined to learn uh, about project management so people are thinking of going into the career and then you have mostly guys are like uh, you have the devops guide developers are like oh, what's my business with project management i'm just here to learn how to use devops too but the first thing i just want everyone to do in this room first is to clear your mind and then um so i'm going to give a brief story um, before I decided to be a project manager, I was looking for the best career to go into project management, products, all those. And I came across a, a page on Medium where it's literally like a page dedicated to the deaths of project managers. And it was so weird how nobody like project managers and then you have developers like oh i'm the one doing all this work and then this person is just disturbing me every time for percentage completion and things like that and it's quite um understandable because project management used to be um a someone to like like micromanage and then follow up and see oh where is this where is this but then it has evolved it has evolved into um the being interwoven into your products and the way your company develops and the roles of project managers have not changed over time. So let's have an open mind and see how knowing these fundamental ways of our project works, fundamental ways of how you as an individual um, contribute to this process, would be able to be able to help you go into whatever job you're doing and then be able to contribute and know how to work effectively with everyone to release the product. So, like I said, project management principles, tools, and techniques is very much based on common sense. Um, there are a lot of professional, PMI, CSM, PSM, but what they will always tell you that it's a framework. 
is very much based on the person. So that's why you have good and bad project managers. You have good and bad developers it's really based on common sense and how you're able to use that framework to be able I'm to- sorry, move. you just hit the refresh button, you'll see that um, the actions are in there. At the moment, there's- in Thank you. So um, it doesn't mean that it's easy, but of course you need to be able to learn all these methodologies. And then you have to also consider most things that I'm going to say here as guidelines. There's really no formula on how to be the best project manager or anything. There's no formula about it. Um, there are no black and white options. There are many shades of gray. Um, a lot of people are always talking scrum, scrum, scrum. But when you really go into different organizations and say, okay, how do you practice scrum? You realize that everybody do it differently. So there's no absolute way. You have to just find a way that works for your organization. So what is a project? Um, let's start from basic. Now, PMBOK defines project as a temporary endeavor that is undertaking to create a unit product, service, or results. Um, anything that is ongoing, no end, it starts, no start and end is not a project. Uh, in project, we call it operations. Now, if you have a product, even if the product is going to be released in two years, it has to have a start and end date. It has to create something unique. And once that is has been defined, then you have a project. Um, once you release a product to market and you have users using it, then it literally become an operational tax. So you've moved on from the project part. So a project is always temporary. It must have a start and end date. And then this just puts it in, in um, clear times. It must have the beginning and the end. It must deliver a unique output and then it must include a lot of complex activities. So um, walking from my house to maybe the estate gates, um, even though it has a start and end, might not necessarily be a project. So there must be complex activities. There must be different parts fitting in together to create a unique output. And then that's where we know that we have a project. Now for projects, give me a minute. Okay. Uh, um, I'm trying to use my presenter view, so, so I'm not familiar with Zoom. Where's the Zoom box? Okay, so I'll just go on. So in projects, we have what we call the triple constraints. Um, for every project, you have the triple, the th three things that always put you in trouble, and that is your scope, which is what am I? What is what is the output I want to deliver? What's the scope of this project? And then you have the time it takes to deliver it, and you have the cost. Now, each of these factors affect, they are like the three most cases, like one would always affect one. If for example, I want to build a bungalow, um, a three bedroom bungalow, and then um, the, um, what's it called? The person building it has told me that it would take me uh, two months to construct it and let's say cost of 10 million Naira to build it. If for some reason, I decide that I no longer want a three bedroom bungalow and I want a duplex. It's going to affect every other thing on this um, triangle. It's going to affect my time, meaning I cannot deliver that in two months again. It's going to affect the cost, meaning that everything will no longer be possible. So changing one would always change the other. Nice. Changing one will always change the other. If also I decide that, no, I don't want um, three bedroom again, or no, I no longer have 10 million. What I now have is 5 million Naira. I won't be able to build a three bedroom anymore. Maybe I'll be able to build a mini flat in a shorter time. So in project, it's always when you're, when one of those things is changing, 
you have to consider the time on and other things. Is why when you have a project that's going out of scope, the project manager has to think, okay, how does it affect the time? If we are adding more items to this, how does it affect the duration on where we would go live? How does it affect the cost? And cost is the people working on it, the developers are paying on it, and maybe anything I'm using, license tools and everything. How does it affect all this other angle? So these are the triple constraints. In changing one, you have to consider the change on the other. And the next thing we're now going to be talking about is just a little history. And I want to ask um, just to, to as, a, as an icebreaker, can anyone give me um, their first knowledge of, um, of projects? And then I think it can be found in the Bible. Yeah. Anyone? The the two hours of Babel. Thank you very much. To be the two hours of Babel. Yes. Yes, that's a perfect example. Zoom is taking control of my screen. Okay, so that's a perfect example. That was the first project um, that I can remember, the Tower of Babel. And even though the Bible talks about it, about um, um, the Bible talks about it, about different um, um, that language changing and then they could not complete the project. It talks a lot about communication in projects, scope and everything. If there's no basic communication, there's really no way your projects can be successful. So it's like the first example. And then I've also put like a brief history of projects and how they've changed and evolved over time. So you have the pyramid of Giza, of course, we know, none of us were there, but I'm sure some people came together and say, okay, we want to build this pyramid. We want it to have this, um, we want it to look this way. What do we need, how much, and then the beauties. We also have the age of discovery. You also have industrial revolution in the 1800. You have the computer time. And then this was when um, bodies started coming together to say, okay, um, there would always be projects. Let's put together structures, methodologies to guide people to be able to do it. And now we are in the 21st century. We are not talking about agile. Nobody's talking about waterfall. Nobody's talking about all those things that Prince 2 and PMI and Co. Everyone is now evolving. Projects are becoming more complex. Um, the output technology is evolving. And then, of course, as this thing changes, how you manage projects, of course, would also change. Now, we're going to talk about what lack of proper project plan because there's always been a miscommunication on, or I'm using, and we'll talk about waterfall and agile later, but there's always been a, mis a miscommunication of, oh, I'm using waterfall, I'm using agile, um, because I'm using agile, we don't need to plan, let's just start and deliver. And then you're not wondering, oh, why is it taking, my project was supposed to, my first release was supposed to be out in three months, why is, this is nine months, it's not out, and you're wondering what went wrong. Whether whatever methodology that is being used, every project must be planned. And I will give a, a very, very simple example, which is the Sydney Opera. I don't know if you are familiar with the Sydney Opera. Is anyone familiar with it? Yes, in Australia. Thank in you. Australia. So I was talking. Can I hear more voices? No, we are not familiar with it. Oh, okay. So um it's a senior opera is a very popular um, iconic building that, that was um, constructed and it was supposed to look like this. This was what they had in mind. Oh, we want to build an opera that everybody must know about. It must go into history books. It should look like this architecture. There was no great, a lot of architectural design. We want a different architectural design. We want it different. And then they came up with this plan and um, we're so, um, the expectation was that it should be completed in six years and then they will spend $7 million. Now, does anyone want to guess how long this project eventually took and how long it cost? And even if they achieved what they um, turned out to want, uh, what they started out with? More than, more than six years. <laughs> okay, how much? Uh, times <laughs> two of the cost. Because just like you said, um, the time has been affected. So obviously it's going to affect the scope and the cost. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Another person wants to give me a guess of how much? Maybe around 30 million uh, Australian dollars. 
That's really it. Okay. Any other question? Uh, I know it costed almost, uh, I think, a little over 100 million. And I think the project spanned over 10 years. Though. Over 10 years. Okay. So uh, this is, first of all, let's even look at what ended up coming out as the opera. So let's look at what they started out as. I don't know what's happening with my myself and Zoom today. Stop taking punches. I think I have a VPN running. So let's disconnect that. All right. Um, Zoom keeps taking control of my screen and moving my cursor around. So sorry about that. So in reality, this project lasted for 16 years and cost, like the last person said, $102 million. Now, do you want to imagine? I'm sure the people that even drew the thing, maybe they were already old, they already had children or grandchildren and you're still building and someone somewhere, the project sponsor is shouting, we've spent so much money, why is this thing not coming out? I don't even want to imagine a project like this in Nigeria, probably would take like maybe 50 years. But then what happens is if you do not plan properly, this is what can happen. I would have given another example, which is the tallest building in Dubai. And then if we had time, I would have played a video. It's a very, if you have time, go on YouTube and play a video on um, project management of um, tallest building in Dubai. You will see there was an entire documentary done about the initial plan, the um, duration it's supposed to take, and the different things that came into place and how they were able to, to manage it because they planned. I think they took over many years to actually plan that before they even started implementing, even though they still didn't meet the, the timeline, but in project, you have a plus or minus for your timeline. They were able to meet the, the worst case scenario. So pro project planning is very, very important. It's like, it's the most important thing, no matter what methodology that you're using. So quickly, we'll go to who is now the project manager. Um, in this session, I'll be using project manager, product, scrum manager, interchangeably, and I'll explain later um, because in scrum, um, project manager or those names are just titles. They're just titles. Anybody can be a project manager. It depends on just what role you're doing. Of course, you have to be, you have to know how to manage projects or be satisfied or things like that. So whether I'm called a project manager or I'm called a scrum master or I'm called whatever title, what matters is what role, like what's the function I'm delivering. So in case I'm, I use those terms, um, to do this, let's not um, be confused. So you can think of project manager as the CEO of the project. And um, this might not go down well with, with some people because who are you? Why are you the CEO of the project? The reason why they are the CEO of the project is they are the one that would always take the it from, they have to manage <laughs> stakeholders. <laughs> Who's laughing? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm sure that's the point that's laughing because he knows, he, he, he knows what, what the PM no. I'm not the person laughing now. <laughs> I know who was laughing, and I'm, I'm curious to know why the person was laughing. It's Chukwe, one Chukwe Mika. Okay. Yeah, Chukwe Mika. So, can you tell us why you're why you laughing, Chukwe Mika? I'm sure you'd have had experience with uh, project managers. Hello, Chukwe Mika. Hello, good afternoon. Sorry, yeah. I wasn't laughing. I just joined the meeting now, and I was listening to something. So, it was... Oh. What are oh, we okay. Not me. Oh, okay. 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 So we're thinking because, of course, if you work with project managers, you would know, uh, you would experience, or if you're friends with project managers, or if you're a, if you've been in a role where you have like a PMC, you would know this that when PMC world, when the younger guys, nobody goes is the PM that becomes responsible. It's no longer, oh, this person didn't do their work or this product was not achievable or anything. The PM is the only person that is accountable. And it's why sometimes they come across as, oh, being too much. And that's because they have to manage three people, three groups of people. 
they have to manage the stakeholders, which is the customers. So if I'm building a product or I'm delivering a project, I have a customer. So I have to manage that customer. I also have to manage the business, um, the business, the what we call the internal customers. So you have the business parts, will be the your um, the CEO, the MD, or the founder, or anything. You have to manage that. Then you also have to manage the the developers that you're working with. And you have to be able to balance these three because sometimes it can be difficult. You have customers saying, I want the old world tomorrow, uh, yesterday. You have business saying, I want to make this profit on this deal and I don't want to, to I don't want to extend. And then you have the developer saying, ah, you want to kill me, I have all these tasks, I cannot do this. And you have to balance all three and always find a middle ground. So the PM is, that's why we call them the CEO of the project because they are responsible for making those decisions that make sure that these three different stakeholders with different um, requirement or different goals are able to achieve their goal. And it can be, a, sometimes it can be a nightmare. So a project is only successful. See, let a, let's do the most beautiful thing. If that um, project is not accomplishing the specific goal within the time and the budget that was agreed at the beginning, it's not a success. So uh, even if oh, I was supposed to build Sydney Opera and then I ended up building it, let's say it was even finer than initially, but it still took me 16 years and 100 and over like um, um, 90 million budget, that project was not successful. So a PM is always needed to take accountability to always tear people and activities to make sure that everyone is directed to meeting that goal, to make sure that they are successful. And then they are responsible for risk and issues. They are the ones that are responsible. As someone said that serious. It's, it's very, 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 very serious, but it's also a fun job. Now, how do I now become, because like you said, it's serious. How am I going to be able to have all these skills to be able to deliver this very, very serious tax? And I've done what we have taking a PM from being a junior PM to being a senior PM. There are different steps and different things that um, you have to get to be able to become a senior PM. And so I'm a senior project manager. Um, I can add my team or I can manage a portfolio of products or things like that. Now, there are three skills that a PM needs to have. We have the project management and business knowledge. You have to know how to manage a project. You have to know the different phases, the artificial, you have to know all those things. Then you also have to know the people and you have to have people and workflow management skills, meaning you have to have people skills. You have to be able to understand your stakeholders, know what works for your stakeholders, communicate with your stakeholders, and also be able to manage the workflow of your tasks. So you have to know what comes next, what comes next after this. You're not waiting um, for, for someone to tell you because you are like the, it's called, we call it the shepherd. In, in the olden days, you have the shepherd guiding like the sheep up a mountain. Uh, of course, we're not climbing mountain today, but in that case, you're still a shepherd and shepherding everyone towards the goal. Then you also have to have strategy and leadership skills. It's a project manager that would say, okay, if I put these stacks and these stacks together, maybe I'll be able to um, meet this goal. I will go all, all, all talk about that. I can reprioritize. I can move this upward. This can give me maximize, uh, maximum value. This can immediate give my um, business ROI. It is a project manager that is responsible for that strategy. Of course, it takes time to, to get there. You have to have had all the experience. So you go from junior PM, to so just be like um, mid-level PM. And then by the time you're a senior PM, you're responsible for strategy, you're responsible for leadership skills, you're responsible for managing portfolio. So when we say program, so you have projects and then you have program. Programs are like similar projects and then you have portfolios which are like, um, so let me give a, an example. So if I am constructing a house, I can say I'm doing a project. If I'm constructing multiple houses in an estate, that can be programmed because each house is a project and then I'm managing a program. Now, if I am constructing houses, airports, hotels, different type of buildings, those are like portfolios because each of them has like different requirements and each of them has a program and then a project. So when you get to the stage where you can say, 
I manage portfolios, I'm managing product, then you have gotten to a senior PM. So you have to have the industry knowledge, the domain knowledge, business acumen, communication, problem solving, people management. You have to have all this. It's why you can never underestimate uh, the role of a project manager in an organization because they have, they see the bigger picture and then they're able to like drive direction into where everybody's supposed to go. So we're going to go now into the project itself. Um, depending on, okay, no matter what methodology you use, every project have five phases. You have the initiation, which is where you say, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to build this product or I want to build this particular thing. Um, this is the scope. This is my budget. This is the end result. This is what I want. And then you have planning where you plan it either in detail or you plan it in detail or iteratively, we'll just talk about it later. And then after planning, you execute, you monitor to say that, okay, monitor is your testing, your testing phase. Um, is this meeting where it's supposed to meet? Do we need to go back to drawing board? And once everything is fine, you close the project either by deploying to production or releasing that particular um, MVP or whichever phase. So we're going to talk about how these five phases now fit into the different methodologies for every project as this five phase. So we're going to talk about pre minor methodologies. For in time past, um, at any times we used to have the waterfall projects. And the reason why it's called waterfall is because every phase has to happen before the next phase. So Let's go back to this um, circle. I have to have my initiation phase, complete it, um, do my project charter, know everything before I go to planning. Once I'm done with planning, I'm, I plan everything end to end. The planning then used to take as much as three months to like five years, depending on how complex the project is. But you would plan everything that would happen from end to end. And then once I'm done planning, I start executing, I hand it over to the developers and then they execute. Once I'm done executing, we do the monitoring phase and then we close. Now, this is why it's called waterfall because one has to happen before the other. This was working there because of course you had projects that were not really complex. And then the projects were mostly not really in the technology sector. So you have construction and things like that. So that's waterfall. Now, I'm going to bring this home to, to see why we are no longer using that process. So waterfall process is also called, methodology is also called the predictive process. And um, I give an example. I also gave a different example in your handouts. Let's assume that I want to bake a cake. Um, two days ago, I was supposed to bake a cake for a friend and then uh, a friend says she wants punch cake. So I want to bake a cake. I've always baked the cake. So it's not a new thing. I go to the store. I buy all the ingredients I want to buy. I buy my flour, I buy my sugar and everything. I come home, mix it together in the mixer, put it in the oven, give my friend a cake. It's a straight shot. At, it's a straight shot to the, to the target. There's really no um, missing the road. Now, the demand. So project weeks, um, for every project or, what, or when you want to determine what methodology to use, we use what we call the project weeks and it can be under two how the demand for that project and the, the demand risks and delivery risks. Now the demand risks of this is, I'm just buying flour, sugar, maybe five items. So the risk is very low. I can always get those things at the store and I know what I want. I know that if I mix uh, 500 gram of this with this, this, I will get my cake. Of course, on delivery risks is also quite low. Like, like I said, the steps are very, very easy. So low risks. And for this process, I can use my waterfall. I can do this, do this, do this, one after the other, and guess my end results. Now, let's assume now that I decided that, oh, I am very good in this cake thing. Maybe project management is not the way for me again. Let me go and be baking cake. Maybe all these um, 38 people on this call, all of them have birthdays, they have friends, they can order for me. And I decide to use it as a business. Now, and I have, the demand is higher because now I have different stakeholders, different people. It's no longer about making sponge cake. This one can say, no, I like red velvet. This one, I like chocolate. This one, I like type of cake. No, I like my cake, everything together. No, I like this design. Different demand. 
Now, what would I do? Do I, I can decide to, okay, go and buy everything in bulk, bake cake, and then hope that somebody would buy it. What happens to that? My cakes, not maybe I made 20 every week. There's the chance that they would like the 20 or I even said the 20 is quite very, very low. So I'm already losing money. Uh, I can decide to say, um, let me do this type of cake, put it into the market. Do people like it? Let me do like three or four designs. Do people like it? Or let me get feedback, go back, change it, and then do it. So this is what we call adaptive process. You don't know what the target is. You're constantly updating and then checking, am I meeting the goal? Okay, take the feedback, build it again, come back and check. And it's why Agile was developed. And then we'll go, we'll go into that shortly. Now, the key thing you need to know about the Agile um, sample is that it's prioritized value. If at any point I'm sending something, it does not have any value, it is not Agile. And then it also prioritizes increment release. So remember when we talked about, um, sorry, it prioritizes increment release. So we talked about waterfall. And imagine if I want to construct the Sydney Opera, for example, or yeah, the Sydney Opera, Hunter Sydney Opera. It would have taken me 16 years as the owner of the project to get that value. I would have waited 16 years. Now that is not agile. Agile says that you should be able to release something useful at every point until you get to the end goal. Something useful directed to what that end goal is supposed to be. And we have an example here, we have a car. A customer comes to you and say, okay, I want, I want to develop a car. I want you to release a car for me. The scope is that, or not, not call it a car. I want you to release a, a product that can move me from point A to point B. It should be able to take between um, maybe two to four people and should use, just put the scope like that. Now, in the waterfall days, you would spend time planning how to develop that product and say, okay, this person looks like, let's say we didn't know what the car was. This, it looks like, uh, we we'll call it a car. Uh, it would have four tires, it would have four doors, this thing, and then they'll spend time building that car. The only thing the customer will be getting is report and everything. Your money is just born, you just keep paying or you've paid, sometimes you've even paid a percentage upfront and you're just waiting, waiting, waiting. It's until this car is ready that you get value and start using the car. But that's not Agile. Agile says, I can release your product. Okay. I just say I can release your product incrementally so that you can you start getting value immediately, pending when you get the full results. So you want a car, you want something to be for quite a The entire thing would take me two years. But every three, three months, I'm going to give you. So someone's mic is on. Can you please mute your mic? Okay. So I'm going to give you something that you can use. Come on. And every three, three months, I'm going to give you something that you can use so that you can start getting your ROI. You can start getting your value immediately. You don't have to wait till end of two years to get a value. So in three months, I'll get to release a first minimum, it's called an MVP, which is a minimum viable product which the customer can start using. And then based on the feedback, because what you've told me you want, I don't even know what it is. You don't know what it is. I'm hoping that I will get it. The only reason I can get it is if I give you something to use and I give me feedback and then I do it again, give me feedback. So I, I make you a, I think this is called a, I think it's Kit, sorry. Can, can, does anyone know what this is called? The name has gone up. Skateboard. A skateboard. A skateboard. Thank you. So I give, I make you a skateboard. A skateboard can be for points A to B. And then I get your feedback, say, oh yes, it's working, but I would like it to be able to take more than one person, or I would like it to move faster, or I would like the tires to be bigger. 
and then I go back and make you what we call, I think this is a scooter or something, and then I make you a bicycle until I get to your car. So the principle of agile, which we'll get to, is that you should be able to release incremental values until you don't have to wait like waterfall where you wait till the end and then the customer is not getting value and the problem with that is that because you're not getting feedback most of the time you're not even building the right thing um a research that was done in year 2000 uh 2000 is a long time ago wow says that Almost 50% of what is built using the waterfall methodology never got to be used because you've collected a customer's requirement and they've got to build. The only time that you're getting feedback from the customer is at the end. And at that point, you realize that we've just built, this guy wanted a swing and then I've got to build a fairy wheel. All he wanted was just a simple swing. And we, the reason why I'm saying all this is to see why the world shifted to agile. Custom, um, businesses were losing money, especially when technology came. Now, the more features you want in a, in, a, in a product, the higher the cost. And then, of course, that is what determines complexity. So imagine if I want to do the skateboard, of course, um, in how many steps, number of features is maybe the board, the tires, and then three features, the cost would be like maybe, let's say 50K to do. If I want to do the bicycle, it has more features. It has the strings, the wheels, the part, the sitting part, the everything is more complex. If I want to build a car, so the more features a product has, the more the higher the cost, and then we'll say the, the project is complex. And the more complex the project is, the, the, the chance that it will fail. So looking at this chart, you can see that you have 45% that is never used. You have, it's just 7% of the projects that ended up being used like always. And then a group of people, especially when technology, the technology boom, a group of people suddenly were not happy with this. Like we are wasting money. How do I say I wanted to build an opera for a budget of six million and I end up being one of six million. There's really no calculation. There's no allowance. There's no, it's just like the Nigerian reserve. There's no reserve I could have done for that project to say I want to keep 100 million for a six million project. Worst case, I would say put half of it in reserve. So I, I budget worst case scenario, nine million and put three million. There's really no scenario that I could have budgeted that the project will go 100 million above cost. So we're wasting money. Yes, yes. So someone said, if Aja was used for senior opera, thank you. The first release would be a canopy where people can just sit down and then maybe you build a tent and then maybe a one room building and then you build. So you would have to release like, and don't forget that the release of course has to be valuable for the customer to get ROI. So we had this group of people, they went to, um, I forgot the name, they went to a remote location to discuss. And even though they didn't agree on a lot of things, what they agreed on was that the process of managing projects needs to change. They all agreed on that. And over two days meeting, so Zoom, please. Why Zoom? So over two days meeting, they came up with what we call that is known today as the Agile Manifesto. It's a 68 words document. It's just 68 words. And then we'll talk about it in the next slide. And they will also now give us the principles of Agile. If you go to agilemanifesto.org, you should still see the original document. And these are the founding fathers, like the people that came up with this thing. And what they said is, so we're going to use on this slide because it's long story story. So let me just, um, let's, let's go to that website and see it. They will come back to it. Okay. Okay. So let me know where you can see my screen. So this is the original 
manifesto. So if you go to agilemanifesto.org, you'll see it. So you can see the manifesto and then you can see the use people and then you see the 12 principles of agile. If I click on this, you're going to see the 12 principles of agile. So it's just long stories. So I try to make it more fun to talk about at least to let us get the, the major thing for it. You can also see the signatures. You can see the signatures. Um, if you click below, you can see the people that supported. But then back to our training. Wow, we've used one hour here. Yeah? Okay, so back to our training. The four, um, the four key things out of this is that for Agile, we are going to be prioritizing individuals and interactions over processes and tools. The waterfall methodology had so many processes. If I remember when I took my PMP, there were about 100 and, 104 processes to be done in the project execution. There were 104 steps. So you can imagine how cumbersome it was to manage a project. So it says we're going to prioritize individuals, people, and interactions, which is feedback over processes and tools. We're also going to prioritize working software over compressive documentation. I don't have to spend three years coming up with a project plan. When I can plan iteratively, I can say, okay, this is what I want to release. I want to release five things. I'm going to have four releases, uh, five releases, and then at every point, the customer is going to get a working software. Then you also have customer collaboration over contract negotiation. So there are a lot of, oh, a customer says, I want a car. Oh, a customer says, I want a bicycle. And then I've gotten a contract to do a bicycle. Now, when I finish the bicycle, the customer realized that this is not going to work. I thought I wanted a bicycle, but what I actually wanted was a car. In Waterfall, that's the end of that conversation. I built you your bicycle, go and use it. If you want a car, come back, we'll talk on new scope, we'll develop a new contract, we'll do that. But Agile is saying, customer collaboration, I give you a first release, you use it, you give me a feedback, it goes into building the next release. We do it until we get to the point we want to get to. So that collaboration over contract negotiation, and then, you also have responded to a change over following a plan. It also goes into the other example I have. A project plan goes to a plan. One to what are for this to this to this to this. If anything changes in that project, that's well, uh, because your scope is going to change. Everything is going to scatter. The payment is all over. Business are shouting. You're going to go and charge the customer for out of scope. But Agile is saying you should be able to respond to it. You should even anticipate a change because there is no sure way to deliver a product with there's a lot of unknowns so you should expect a change and be able to respond to it quick rather than say we are following a plan and they are telling you because we still talk about how they intersect because somebody's going to ask so if i'm if i if i'm working a project for a third person how will i charge the customer when i don't even know when the project would end or when we are done where we did so we're going to talk about how they interact and you see that the founding father also said that even though there's value you do not throw away the items on the right we are just saying we are going to start valuing the one on the left more we're not going to get hung up on the item on the right so the items on the right are the process and tools documentation contract negotiation over the ones on the left and then we're going to talk about the 12, the 12 Agile principles. One is deliver value early. I think I've talked about it a lot. Deliver value early. Do not wait to the end of the project. Yeah, should, the customer should start getting their, their return on investment as early as possible. The second one is technical excellence. You know, I mentioned prioritizing individual interactions. So you have to know, you have to know what you have to do. And a lot of people, most, there's a, there's a set of people that, any little thing they say, oh, it's agile. Agile is not an excuse to be lazy. Agile is not an excuse to not do proper, proper, your proper job or to document your processes or to have your, it's not. Because you can see that the second principle is technical excellence. You have to be the best at your field for you to say, oh, I'm doing agile. 
And then the third one is communication. Prioritize one-on-one -on -one face to face communication. There is no, oh, dear, something. I just even like anything that is like, uh, it, just walk up to the person, walk up to the customer, walk up to your product owner. There should be communication. It prioritizes communication. And then the fourth one we've talked about is embrace change, expect change, embrace it. Don't run away. Don't say it's not in the scope, it's not in the original plan. Embrace change. Then the fifth one is deliver frequently. And you can see that join, there's a big box. You don't have to wait for the boxes ready. You can deliver little, little boxes until you get to the big, big box. And then the sixth one is simplicity. There's simplicity, there's, there's, there's goodness and simplicity. You have to be able to we'll get there. You have to be able to break down an idea into simple tasks that can be delivered by one person in nothing less in nothing more than 20 hours so if you have a tax that is bundled up very big, you don't know what it is until the tax can be broken down and you can see it as a simple tax then that tax is already to be worked on and then you also have um done is 100 like we'll talk about our definition of done when do you say something is done done is not uh, okay i've done what is in the project plan that's it if you like it's not work it's your business done is when it's at 100 percent then we have reflecting on performance when we go to scrum events we talk about retrospective sessions where you take feedback oh i don't know what's happening with me and zoom today where you take feedback you reflect on the team's performance you take learnings you go back and become better and then number nine is trust and support in a agile in a scrum team you have to trust and support each other there's no i in a scrum team there's no i did my work when we when we have time to talk about you see how everyone comes together there's no i did my work it's be that did not do their work and um um that's why they put the thing did, did not deliver the release no there's trust and support. There's everybody working together. You can see the picture is a picture of someone with a bow and arrow and trying to shoot an apple or someone's head. You have to trust and support. There's no surprise. Then 10 is sustainable pace. The team should be able to work at a sustainable pace so that they do not burn out. In Agile, the team are the one that determine time estimate, how long to them to do a release, the team, the velocity and everything. You do not allow your team to burn out. And then we have self-organized teams in Agile. So you remember I was saying titles, they're just different titles. We have an Agile team, a Scrum team, and then everybody now has like a role. So I'm going to be the product owner, I'm going to be the, so wow. you're self-organized. There's no somebody from somewhere telling you this is, you have to be self-organized. And the last one is business and developers must work together. And the waterfall days, you have the business people, they'll go and sell um, flowers and rainbows to the customers, collect requirements, dump it on developers table, um, developers will work and send and then you see that. So business and developers and the customers must always work together to be able to deliver um, the, the product. So this page talks about the Agile Manifesto and the 12 principles of Agile and how since then, We've not been using Agile. So under Agile, we have Scrum, we have Kanban, we have Extreme Programming, we have different ones, but Scrum is like the most popular, which is the one we'll be talking on today. So before we move on, I don't know if there are any questions. We've literally spent an hour. Wow. I don't know if there's any questions before we move on. And uh, if that will also want me to continue. Yes, I think we can just continue and um, finish up so that at least we can take questions from anybody that wants to ask. Okay. Can go ahead. Yeah. Okay, all right. So does anyone have any question or feedback before we move on? Okay. How is the class going so far? Maybe I do it from the beginning. I like feedback. So you know, class is interesting. It's interesting. Oh, yeah. That's that's a nice thing. Okay. Any other feedback? Yeah, Emmanuel. I think there's Emmanuel Uboma. Emmanuel, do you have any question? Because I see that you 
You tell your mic. Hello, Emmanuel. So it's me and my and Zoom. I really don't have control of my system anymore. Oh, no, 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 no. It's weird. Okay, so the, can you stop sharing and maybe you I can can't try even to control the the mouse is moving on its own. So. <laughs> can you try to share from your end so that it can kick me off? Go off the meeting, turn off your internet. Okay. Let's try that. That is this is very strange. Usually Zoom doesn't request for your um mm -hmm. I feel like Stone is trying to, to Yeah, yeah. So I've been wanting to say it since. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's try this again. Are you there? So if you get a pop up from Zoom requesting mm -hmm. for access to control your screen, I think you should just reject it. Yeah. Yeah, but then I'm not able to share my screen. Zoom mm -hmm. is requesting remote control of your screen. You can regain control at any no, time. No, don't right? deny it. Just deny it. It keeps popping up. Just deny it. And it keeps popping uh, up until you approve it. Okay. It doesn't share the screen. There's okay. a user on this meeting that has no name and no GP. Can you try and kick out that user? Let's see. Or ask him to identify himself or something. Okay. I think the user. Yeah. Is that okay, out. the person has left? Yeah. yeah. So it could have been that person. <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. That's, That's interesting. <laughs> That's very interesting. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Sam. Um, Samo. Okay, so you can try again now. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, you can see my screen here. Yeah? Yes, I can see your screen. It's still, it's still asking for that, but yeah, it's still asking for me to approve or decline. No, don't deny it. Deny it. You can see your screen now. Who is okay, this? Okay, you guys need to see what's happening on my screen. There's an instant tailoring requesting remote control of your screen. Instant tailoring. Mm. Can you the um, can you disable requests? I think uh, like I don't know. Only so change. Okay, the, can you the try The person now? is a participant. Kick the person out. I can see instant tailoring here. Yeah, yeah. Now yeah, yeah. protect the person out. Okay, let me remove the person. 
Um, hello, can you um can you restrict the um the participants to only the person presenting a loan to share screen? To share that's screen. also very important. Only the only the presenter alone, that no other person should share the screen except the presenter alone. Because I know that uh, I know that it can be both. Uh, participants can share screen and the this can share screen. That's what always happens. So okay. can we restrict okay. to only the presenter to share a screen? Share screen, okay. Is it still asking for that? Yeah. No, it has actually stopped asking after you that's, click the instant. Okay. okay, that can be done by the host. Thank you. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think we can go ahead. Apologies for the glitch. Okay, hopefully no damage was done. Nice. All right, so, so let's go into Scrum itself. So, oh, that was, that was fun. <laughs> let's go into Scrum itself. So what exactly is Scrum? Because I've been talking about Agile, so we're going to focus on Scrum. And the reason why I'm talking of Scrum is, is literally what most people use. Um, so people use extreme programming, so people use Kanban, but at least from my own experience and the communities I'm in, both um, in Nigeria and international world and from the certifications I've done, Scrum is like the most popular methodology that is used. Now, in a nutshell, Scrum is just you splitting your product. So you can see this box of products, splitting it into tiny, tiny products, splitting the time and then splitting your team. So you can see I'm releasing each part of this product at specific times in the month until I get to my final products. And then I also have, and I'll split my team. Instead of having 30 development team or saying they're working on one product, I split the team into a team of three to, I think they should, a scrum team should not be more than 10, if I remember, three to 10 to work on specific product. And this is because it's easier to manage, it's easier to have accountability when you have smaller team. And that is just what Scrum is in a nutshell. So Scrum is based on, and I was going to, I, I mentioned earlier, Scrum is like, if you really have used Waterfall or used other methodologies, you would know that the Scrum has nice PR. Is like uh, is like Gary or or it has nice PR. You think is this nice methodology that helps you get your product out and everything, but it's kind of like the hardest methodology. But then it's just based on some simple things which we'll talk about. And if you're able to follow those things, you would see that you're going to be releasing the best products markets. Now it's based on lean thinking. There's, like I said, there's nothing, don't need to be elaborate. One plus one is equal to two. There's nothing complex. If a particular thing is being complex, it means you've not done the work to break it down as much as possible. Oh, the person is back, therefore. Napo, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. All right. So then you also have also based on empirism. And this means that it's based on the collective knowledge of the people of the scrum team. It means that every you cannot just have a team and say, oh, I have a team. Everybody has to like pull their weights. You have to be self-organizing. So you have to use that collective knowledge to be able to deliver what you want. And then he relies on three pillars. One is transparency. Lawrence Adigbo, that's the name of the person that is trying to hack my system. So we have transparency. Everyone must know what is happening. Hello. Hello. Uh, I can't be the one, though. <laughs> Your name just pop up. I think they are using names of people on the... <laughs> No, no, no. I'm using my mobile phone to listen to to the trade. So could it be the reason why that is happening? Uh, are you on two devices? No, are you on two, uh, are you on two devices? Are you on two no, devices? No, I'm just I'm at home. I can now. see your name appearing twice. 
Are you on I two devices? Is, what I'm saying. I think the person is using. Yeah, maybe, maybe because I signed in, I signed in twice. Uh, no, no, maybe maybe I no matter the number of times. Let me do it. One is I don't think it's you. I think somebody's just trying to use the names of people there to like max who they are. Okay, listen there. So you can go ahead to share your screen now. We have restricted, we have restricted only one person to be able to share the screen. So you can go ahead. Can you request for share? Uh, post disabled participant screen sharing. I think I'm still okay. Sure. Okay. You have to take this in one of your classes, so that Paul. Yes, we will. <laughs> make a co-host if it's a license. If it's a license, make a co-host so that she can can be able to manage her, her system and manage her screen. Okay, let me see. Um, With that, she can be able to share her screen. I can okay, share. Make hosts. Yes, just make a co-host. <laughs> Person is not Adiola Alayante. Once we do that, nobody will be able to uh, my, um, check out that. Okay, it's in there now. You can go ahead. Okay. Sorry for the breaking interest. We have to do this. You get you guys use it as your case study in your security class. <laughs> There's one. Okay, so um Scrum relies on three, like I said, three pillars. One is transparency. And um, so this class is to be able to know how to meet either you going to the project management field or how to meet your project manager's affair. Um, you, I'm sure most of us have had times when someone's come and say, what are you working on? And you're like, oh, I'm working on something. I'm like, no, um, I was this stuck. I'm like, why are you asking me so much question? And that's because the basis of Scrum is that everyone should be able to know what everyone is working on without having, because it's called a self-organizing team. Going to the backlog or going to whatever tool that is being used, you should be able to know what's, is happening in the sprint, we're speaking what, what the velocity is, what is left without having to go and be following up. But we have someone wanting one side of the pie and no one wants to do the other side of the pie. So if you're not transparent and then we also have inspection, you should be able to, everyone, your product owners, your scrum master, your team members should be able to inspect what has been done and say, okay, are we meeting the goal and if we're not meeting the goal, what do we need to adapt? So we have transparency, inspection, and, ad and um, adaptation, and, and adaptation, sorry. So you have to, be able to go back to the drawing board. Okay, what was the goal for this, for this particular sprint? How did we do it? Okay, what do we need to get better and do it better? So these are the three pillars. And then Scrum now has five values. We have focus, we have commitment, respect, and openness, sorry, four value, openness. You have to be open. There is no, oh, I'm working on, on, on something. Nobody knows what you're working on. You're working on it for, for three weeks. How is it coming? What goal is it supposed to meet? How does it meet our goal? What are you picking up for the backlog? And then respect one another, respect your team, respect. So in the scrum team, we still talk about what makes up the scrum team. And then commitment to that goal. Remember we said a scrum team is self-organizing. In the real sense of it, in a scrum team, you have three to 10 people. We have the developer, the product owner, the scrum master, and the project manager. Sometimes these two people act as one. And the developers, are, when we say developers, they are not like uh, software engineers, that's why I call it developers. They are called, it's called developers. So in that way, you have your DevOps, your UI UX, your engineer, your everything. And everyone is committed to when you start a sprint and say, this is the goal of this sprint. Everyone is committed to meeting that goal and then focus. So if you're able to do everything on this page, 
then you can comfortably say I am practicing Scrum. Basically. All right. So we'll go to um the Scrum process. So I've literally said this. Um, so this is the entire end-to-end -end Scrum process. You have the product owner, which we'll discuss later, interfacing with the stakeholder to get what the vision is. Okay, what's this product supposed to do? And then having that vision and coming to work with the developers. Now, don't forget that the developers in this time is not like software engineer developers. It is what the Scrum team is called. It's actually called the development team. So you have developers which span the different job roles and then you have the Scrum master and then they all work together to develop the product backlog. Now, once they work together to develop the product backlog, they now pick items of this product backlog that goes into a sprint and then work on developing that. Um, so each sprint, uh, so you have a product goal and then you have a sprint goal. So once you break down the vision into um, goals or into goals into the backlog, each sprint, you pick one of those goals, two or three, depending on the velocity of the team and then deliver it in a sprint. During the sprint, you have what we call daily stand-up, where every day, this standup should not be more than for 15 minutes. Every day you come, you talk each team member, or depending on how you want to do it, talk about what they did the previous day, what the blocker was, what they are doing the next day. And then following the completion of the sprint, you have a sprint review, and then you release a, please let us forget the valuable incremental release. We release, depending on the release plan, you release a, a valuable, and then if it's ready, you ship the products. So this is the entire cycle. And you can see this happens. You can see it's it's in a loop. You go back, to, once this is done, you go back to the pile clock, you pick the item, and it's the entire, what we call the Scrum time box. So you have all these different activities. So when should I decide to use Scrum? Because I've talked about Agile, I've talked about anything. And the more, so you can see on the y-axis, you have the technology. Is it a technology I know? I want to build a website. Um, or yeah, I want to build a website for, or let's say a blog. I want a blog to talk about cooking. So I like cooking. So you probably hear a lot of cooking examples. I want a blog to talk about cooking. Um, one page to link to another sub page. That's all. Simple requirements. So the more unknown the technology, and the more unstable the requirement, the more complex the project. And that is when you use Chrome. When you don't know what it's supposed. Have you ever been in a room and say, "Oh, we want to develop something." Well, all we know is what we want the thing to do, but we don't know how to get there. That is when you use Chrome. So the more unknown the technology, the more unstable the requirement, the more complicated the require um, the the project, and that is when you use Scrum. So we'll go to the Scrum team. You know, I've been talking about this a lot. A Scrum team is called the. It used to be called uh, the development team, and the, so you had the development team, and then you had the product owner, and then you had the Scrum master, and then there was now a us versus them because you have the product owner and the scrum master chasing the development team and then it's like a us versus them so in the latest version of um of the scrum um guide which is which was in 2020 that was scrapped so we now have what we call the um, um development team or called developers and in the developer in the development team you had product owner a scrum master and then you have to develop the dev team so in the dev team, of course, you can, they have different roles. You can have your UI UX, you can have your DevOps guy, you can have your software engineer, depending on what you're building. And then this is what we now call the Scrum team. Now, it's, you also, the fact that um, a, a Scrum master can be a member of the development team. So as I said, they are just titles. So I can be a, a member of the development team and then act as Scrum master. And the only person that cannot act as that is the product. The product owner is separate. So you can pick up roles and what you're supposed to do. Now we have what we call Scrum events. Um, there are five Scrum events. I've kind of talked about most of them. So you have sprint planning. Sprint planning is where you de um, decide what to do in a sprint. Sprint planning should not take more than three hours. 
every week or every two weeks. It shouldn't take more than that. It should take less than 6% of your total sprint time. So if your sprint is supposed to be a two weeks time box, sprint planning should not take more than 6% of time. So sprint planning is where you go to the backlog and then you say, what items are we ready to pick? The product owner will prioritize items in that backlog based on the vision, feedback from customers or whatnot, and then say, okay, these are the um, items that we need to release. And the development team picks these um, items, do our, we're going to talk about estimation, we're going, to, we're going to build our own backlog and do all that, and then we group the backlog. We have daily scrum, I've talked about daily scrum. Daily scrum should not take more than 15 minutes. It's not, an, it's not a meeting for discussing plenty of things. It's just a quick, what did you do yesterday? What was the blocker? What did you do tomorrow? If there's an extension, maybe there's a blocker that needs to be discussed, then a meeting should be set outside scrum. And then you have sprint review. Sprint review is always happens at the end of a sprint. And is when you review what you've done in the sprint. So if during this sprint, we're supposed to, we've talked about websites, I was supposed to um, um, set up the, the contact us uh, page, for example. You're not reviewing, okay, did we do that? Was it tested? Is it ready? Uh, and then you're just reviewing, is it ready to be shipped and all that? And then retrospective is when, you have to remember these 12 principles of Scrum. You have to always look in the mirror and say, what did we do um, um, this sprint? What could have been done better? What are the lessons that we can take into the next sprint? So it's always important to have a retrospective session and then you now do, so it happens in circle. Once you do a strategy, you do sprint planning again, groom your backlog, have your daily Scrum, at the end of the sprint, do your review, do retrospective, go back and do sprint planning. So most organizations have a two week time box for sprints. And then every two weeks you have this um, event happening. So if I go on, I don't know if there are any questions before we move on. Questions, we are really quiet. Can we please drop a thumbs up if we are still together? Thumbs up. I have thank a question, you. sorry. Ah, finally, a female, thank you. I've been wondering <laughs> where the girls were. <laughs> I will enjoy your session. Very, you're, very, you're a very lively person. Well done. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I quite didn't get the difference between retrospective and sprint review. Could you please explain? Okay. All right, that's thank a very you. good question. Thank you. So sprint review happens with stakeholders. Um, sometimes you're working on a product for an external customer. Um, we can sprint review is to come and show, oh, this is what we've worked on to so test it and see if it meets requirements. So call it a UAT, for example. So you either have it with the product owner or maybe the customer or the business, maybe the CEO or things like that. It's an event. You have agenda that you send. Now, retrospective happens within the team, within the development team. So sprint review is with external people, why right? so is within, you're looking at what you did. Did we do, how did we, did we meet our targets? What did we do wrong? What could we have done better? So it's within the team, why right? sprint review is with external stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Any other question? Okay, so we'll move on. I really wanted us to do a bit of class activity. So let's take a poll. And we still have a couple of slides to go before we get to group tax. So should we go straight to group tax so we get our hands dirty or should we like finish our slides? So let's, let's drop our suggestions on the chat. Okay. okay, so we have, okay, I think group tax has won then. All right, so we'll go straight to group tax. Now for the DAS uh, mentees, 
you have your groups. So I would expect that the tax that I'm giving, you'll be having your discussion in your, in your groups. Now for the external guys that joined, uh, you just do it yourself. Like you don't need to do it as a group. We just do the tax by yourself and then raise questions. And um, we will not be able to complete the group tax. It's, it's a lot. Um, the DAS meetings will work over it over the week, but at least we'll be able to start. Um, we'll find a way to maybe get the handout. I don't know that we can decide that get the handout to maybe the external guys that join or find a way for the external guys to join DAS. So in case you're interested in completing the tax. Okay. So we'll go straight to group tax. The first tax is, like I said, we're going to get our NDT. We're going to start up a product. We're going to build a product. We're going to build our backlog. I can't tell you again, no, please. Okay. Can anyone hear me? The audio is very audio. low. Okay. Oh, that's clear. Okay. No, we can hear. Um, can hear you, Sunday. Okay. All right. So, like I said, um, we're going to build our backlog. We're going to do the entire thing. So, I'm going to be using a. <laughs> So in your handout, there is an example that I put in there about a product I want to build. That is what I'm going to be talking on. You can decide in your separate groups to work on a separate product. It's quite fine. If you don't want to use a product in the handout, it's quite fine. You can pick your own products. But for this product, so the first thing you have to do is name your product. If you're using my product, you're picking your product, it needs a name and then nominate who is going to be your product owner. We've talked about what the product owner is, but to cap it up, a product owner is a person that is responsible for the product vision, responsible for meeting the business goals, is one that interacts the stakeholders, is one that is responsible for the backlog, and then also um, responsible for development team. So that means your product owner is the person that would be doing the presentation, even though all of you will work on it together, that will be the person that will be presenting the end end goal at the review session so you can nominate your product owner so while we do that we're going to talk about the product and then i'm just going to read from the handouts do that so if you go to your handout page So if you go to your handout, it should be a page, uh, yeah, page, sorry, oh, there's no page, lesson three. So our founder in this case, the name of our founder is Olumide. Now, Olumide, of course, I'm very partial to gender equality. So Olumide is a girl, of course, our father is a girl. And uh, Olumide has had issues with the rent markets in Lagos. Like every year, rent is going up. I imagine you are earning how much, you're just entry level, and your office is in Lekki VI. It's becoming stressful, it's becoming for men, but to get out on the island is, is war. And then she thinks that the Nigerian market is ripe for disruption. She believes that only about less than 6% of millennials can actually afford to rent with the prices that is going on. And then she wants to be able to, to, to fix that because she believes that in about three years, most millennials will not be able to live on the island. They would either be living on the mainland or even going out of Lagos, coming to work from Ibado and Co. And this would result to longer time to commute because rather than go 10, 15 minutes to work, you're spending three hours in traffic to and fro and then affects even deliverable of work. So she has also noticed that there's been an increased demand for house sharing. So every time she goes to look for house, she sees um, a duplex and then they say one room in the duplex and they are sharing with multiple people, people are sharing kitchen and sharing all that. But she has noticed that there's not many good services. After she has spoke to a couple of people, like there's always issues, management of everything in the house is an issue because you're living with different people, different agreements and all that. So she wants to create an Airbnb-like service. But instead of Airbnb where you go and stay two days, three days, it's essentially going to be like the one year, but it's, so it's going to be for a long time out sharing. And then she believes that the property owners themselves will be able to use it to find suitable people to come and get the house. 
And then she has come to you as a product owner to help her deliver this product, this vision that she has. So like I said, first thing we have to do is name our products. So name your products and then name your product owner. And she also got some funding. Uh, she got about, let's say, how much should we say? Let's say like $1 million to realize her vision. So she has a team. She has put together a development team, which is you guys in your group. And then now we have the first meeting between the product owner and the development team. So are we still on the same page and can we move on? Yes, we are. Thank you. Okay. So are we sorted in our groups? And then guys that are not in group, are we also on the same page? So I like feedback a lot. So I always come back to ask you that question. Okay, now that we've named our product owner, the next thing we have to do is populate our product backlog because we have a vision. How do we get the vision to, how do we go from vision to product? Now I'm going to just talk about the things that we have in the product backlog. In the product backlog, you have the features, what you want your product to be. You have defects. So remember we said we have sprints, we have review sessions, we have retrospection. So once I release a feature and it's being used, there can be a feedback that, oh, um, this particular button um, is not working. Contact us button is not going anywhere. That's a defect that needs to be fixed. So it comes into the backlog because it's a tax that needs to be assigned. You also have Spike. Um, recently, um, there was a way for virtual cards or let's say, yeah, virtual dollar cards. Let's assume that you started working on a, on a financial product and that, was, that feature was not there. And suddenly everybody's using virtual card and your product owner says, I think our product will get more value if we add this technology. Now it wasn't your original plan, but don't forget that for Agile, we, are, we embrace change. So a spike can be something like new technology or things like that. And then we have technical, um, I can be working on a version. So um, working on a version of a product or using a particular product system. And then I want to migrate. So based on feedback on usage, that particular um, version is no longer working. My system is not hanging. So let's say I had version one and it was for like 10 people to come to my site. And now I have 50 people. The system can no longer take it. I have to upgrade that system. It's also a tax. It goes into your product backlog and of course features. So these are the things that will be your product backlog. But because we are starting from scratch, we're going to just start from features. And then once you start working on a project, you'll be able to populate all these other things. Now, if I open some people's fridge here, yeah, I'm sure it's going to be scattered. And then I'm going to open some people's fridge and then it's well arranged. Your product backlog is like your fridge. It should not be messy. Now, everybody's busy, product is busy, development is busy, you're trying to release product, you're trying to race against time. So the time to boom your back backlog might not be there. But the longer you leave your backlog messy, the longer it's going to affect your product because developers will not know what items they're supposed to pick. Testers will not know what items are ready for testing. Um, the product owner doesn't know what's ready to be shipped and everything is just messy. And then before you know it, you're not reaching your product vision. So you're, you should always give time. When we talk about Scrum events, we talk about backlog grooming. You should always give time to groom your backlog. So grooming backlog is, oh, what items are ready to move into sprints? What items do we need to break down further? What items are ready to be? So we're still going to talk about definition of ready and all those things. And then making sure that your backlog is always clean. Items that are supposed to be test, your release items, your to-do items, your items in coding, they are well um, arranged. So don't allow your product backlog to be as messy as your fridge, um, basically. And then, so we are going to start building our product backlog now. There are four steps to building your product backlog. You have framed the journey. And the next task we're going to be doing is de defining our goal. I've talked about product goal. I've talked about spring goal. Product goal is where I want my product to be at the end of the time or at the end of the day. I want what Olumide wants is an Airbnb like service for long time sharing. Sprint's goal is now this particular 
feature, this particular item that I'm picking in this time box, let's say two weeks time box, what is it going to achieve? So sprint goals are like more um, short temporary for the sprint, Why product goal is a long term. So the first thing we're going to do is to do our, 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 our goal. And for that, that will be the next task. I dropped a template in your handout, and then I'm also going to go to a website that, um, sorry, let me just share my desktop. I'm going to go to, this is the templates we're going to be using. Uh, okay. So this is, sorry, I said not the website. This is um, Google Doc. So I've created this template. Um, it's initially, let me give, it was done by Roman Pitcher, is one that developed this template and then it's what everyone use going forward. So this version of this template is in your handout, so you can use to create your product goal. So the first thing we need to determine is why are you creating this product? What's the vision of the product? Then we need to determine our target group. We need to determine the problem the product is going to be meeting and then the unique selling point of your product and then how it will benefit the company. So because of time, you're going to do this during the week. So you have to work with your teammates to determine your product goal. This is going to be the end goal. This is where no matter how many sprints or how many release, this is your product goal. Uh, so a product goal can, can change, but it's not always advised for a product goal to change. Every other thing can change, but the end goal is you're trying to meet this particular vision, except the business direction change. So Tracy says, um, I don't think that market is, is stable anymore. I have to, I've changed my mind. Now you cannot have two product goals. The moment the product goal change, you have to dump this one, junk it, and then start another product goal, start another backlog and everything. So one rule you should know is there can only be just one product owner. There can only be just one product goal and there can be just one back one product backlog. You can have multiple teams working on the same product goal using the same backlog managed by the same product owner. But you cannot have one product, multiple backlog, multiple product owners. So the rule of thumb is one product owner, one product goal, one product backlog, and then you have your teams, okay? So tax two, you have to populate this sheet. All right, I, I'm trying to look at time I said we should do this together, but we still have a lot to go on. So just drop a message um, in the group if you have any, if you need any help with this. So the next thing we're going to be doing is now we know what the vision is. Now we have to create the backbone of our, our, of our vision. And for that, we use what we call user stories. Now user story as uh, is just, is, is, is a small, card that answers the question of as a user. So one thing you should know is user story is always from the user's perspective. You remember the story of um, building a product. I don't know if it's a very familiar story, building a product for that the customer would never use because you thought that this is this would make sense for the customer. So you went to build it. Oh, um, there's now a virtual card. I think people will like virtual cards that are printed in gold and they go and build it. Whereas the user just wants virtual card that they can use on Apple Music. So you have to always get your user story from the user perspectives. Um, some big organization, organization will do user research, while some it's up to the product owner or depending, yeah, it's up to the product owner. Don't forget that product owner in this sense is just the role the person is performing in the group. So a product owner can be the project manager, it can be the VP product, it can be the co-founder, it can be whatever. But in this role, they are performing as the product owner. Those product owners to find out what um, the user would do. So it just always goes as a user, I want this to be able to do this. Um, question, you said there should be only one product backlog. Does this result having only one entry? No, 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 no. That's, um, so a backlog um, can have, <laughs> I've seen backlogs that have over 1,000 items. 
So imagine you're working at, uh, let's say Zoom, Zoom for example. Zoom as a product has only one backlog. It has all the features, no matter even features that you don't even know that it's not to market. It has all the features. It has all the feedback you've given, the defect, the fix it has. Now you can have up to 10 teams working on the Zoom products. So you can have a team focused on video conferencing. You can have a team focused on sound. You can have a, a team focused on um, user experience. You can have a team. You can have 10 teams, but the rule is all those teams have to work from one product backup because the product backup is like, it's like the building blocks of your product. So you don't want different ones. You're going to miss the product. So you're going to have one product owner, one product, one backlog and then multiple teams. So as much as different things can enter your backlog, there's no limit to items that, so we're still going to talk about backlog grooming, how you're breaking down tax and how I can go to backlog. There's no limit to entries that can go into your backlog. It can be, it's a living document that's always populated. So I don't know, okay, that answered your question. All right. So the idea of a, of a user story is, and remember we said about Agile, everything has to be simple. There's really nothing complicated. So it's to, well, it's called three Cs. It's supposed to be like an invitation card. So if you go to some offices, you will see that they have a physical board where you would see sticky notes. And then we would use a digital copy. I dropped the link, we'll also go and look at it here. And it's supposed to be, a story is supposed to be contained in just that tiny sticky paper. Anything more than that, you're making it complicated. So it's like giving somebody an invitation card. So the user story is supposed, it's supposed to look like an invitation card. And then you're giving it to your team members for us to have a conversation. So I've given you a card that says, as a user, I want to be able to do this to achieve this. Let's add the conversation. So the team members come together, the development team comes together and say, okay, this user wants to be able to, um, let's use our, store, our, our product, which is um, home sharing. So as a user, I want to be able to come to your website and see available houses in Lekki. So that is a story. Now the team members are not going to say, okay, for this user to be able to do this, what do we need to do? Okay, um, the website should be able to have a feature to search by location. The website should be able to have a feature to search by house type. Uh, so you would now have the conversation of what needs to be done to achieve this particular user story. And then once that is confirmed, it goes into the backlog. So three Cs, a card, which has an invitation of what the user wants a conversation with the team on how to achieve that, and then the items into the backlog. So for our next task, we're going to be doing our user story for whatever products that we've picked. I'm going to do for the product that's in the, in the handout, but I'm just going to do to like maybe first three levels so that for the people that decide to use my product, I'll not have given them expo so that the ones that are using their products will not feel left out. So for this, I'm going to be using cardboard.io. Um, it's a free website, cardboardit.com. There are a lot of free websites where you can use to create your user stories. There are a lot of free. The good thing about Agile is there are a lot of free there's like resources everywhere. So I'm going to be using cardboardit.com. You can use cardboardit. You can decide to use a physical board a physical board with your sticky notes, depending on what you want to do, but I'm going to be using this. And then let's try to sign in. Okay, so I think I already created something for this. I don't think I started it though. Okay, so let me just start from the beginning. Let's start from the beginning. So I'm going to use user story map and create. Let's call it, okay, I don't have a name for my product yet, so I'm just going to call it DAS Mentorship Session. Please confirm you can see my screen and what I'm doing. We can see your screen. Okay. So now this is what it looks like. I have my sticky notes here. You can see it looks like tiny sticky notes, any color that I want. I can also decide to use pictures. 
add an image card or put in a picture. And then we have our dividers. I'll explain what dividers are later. Now, two things we need to know in user stories is that in creating your user story is that you don't have to have all the information. One. And then two is that we have what we call epics. I don't know if anyone here has ever watched Lord of the Rings. Has anyone seen Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So now, Lord of the Rings came out in a time where seasonal movies were not familiar. I'm sure if Lord of the Rings came out there now, it would have been like a limited series or season one and season two. So it was a movie that was too long to be into inside one movie. It was really too long to be one movie. So they broke it down into three parts. And that is what we call epic. An epic is a story that's too long and complicated to be a, to be a, a user story. So um, let me look for a relatable example and try to, to talk. So let's say for, for um, the story, the product we're talking about, so let's say a requirement is that as a user, I want to be able to um, stay in a house. Now, stay in a house has plenty other tiny stories between. If I have to break down stay in a house, it means that I have to be able to be able to find the house, check the house, inspect the house, get the price. Maybe since it's home sharing, see my roommate. So there's other other stories on that. So it's going to be if I make it just stay in the house, it's going to be very complicated. Don't forget that the purpose of Agile is to make everything as simple as possible. So for that, we have we call them epics. So epics is um a a like I said, a story that is too large to just be so I just call it an epic and then I break it down into user stories. So let's start by um, starting with our epic. So for this, I'm going to be using three epics. So the first is as a user, I want to be able to even find the house. That's my first epic. So you just drag your card down and then put it, um, find the house. Okay. And then as a user, I also want to be able to book. Excuse me. To book. After I found the house, I want to be able to like um book sign an agreement all those things um agency fee legal things and all that so i want to be able to book then i want to be able to now stay moving um meet my roommates and all that stay in the house so these are the three things i want to be able to do as a user now for me to now find a house what are the things that i have to do under it so for me to find the house, I probably have to be able to, to go to a place to search, right? Feedback, feedback, feedback. Yeah, this yes. is interactive. We have to, we have to talk together. So I have to be able to search. What other thing should I be able to do to find the house? Use your map. To use a map, okay. So we are still that's still on that. To, so to use a map is in searching. So that's a feature to be able to search a house. But apart from we are talking about stories now, don't forget that we're going to break it down to the. We are still going to break down to the smallest level. So aside from searching for the house, what can I what do I want to do? I should be able to visit the house to, to inspect, inspect. Probably inspect the house. Inspect the house. Thank you. Okay, so let's leave it at that so that, like I said, I don't want to give you guys expo. So let's break this down and I'll come to book. So to search a house now, so to see how I'm breaking, search for a house, what are the things that I need to be able to do? Select Loc your preferred location. Sorry? Location. Location, okay. So I should be able to, let's say, filter by location, right? Yes. Okay. What again? The type of house you want, your preference, something like that. 
better by um, house type. Right. Okay. All right. Images. Okay. <laughs> if we are going to finish this assignment, no, you can't do it by yourself. Let's <laughs> let's move on. Okay, so to be able to inspect the house, what should I be able to do? Where are the girls? Where are the girls? You, sh you should be able to establish contacts with the establish contacts. Thank you. Okay. So probably okay. All right. What else? One more thing. Um, get some pictures of the house. Maybe there's some images of the apartment. <laughs> Inspect the house. Okay, let's put it there. Product vision. So view images. Yeah? Okay. All right. So this is how you can keep breaking down. Um, like I said, because assignment. So okay, let's do. Let's just do all the line down and then we'll call it there. So to book, what are the things I should be able to do? So think high level, you know, break price. it down. To do what? You should be able to know the amount, the price you, the amount you are paying for the house. Uh, should I not go on that finding okay. the house? This, now you found it, you've seen the house that you wanted. You've, you've gone to the website, you've seen it. Now you want to book, you want to you want to pay your rent, you want to start living. You've inspected the house, you've done everything. So to book a house, what are the things I need to be able to Method do? of payment. Okay, make payment. Payment method. So let's say make payment. Okay. And then one more. Let's say sign agreement. So I'm trying to keep time. Okay. So on that method, Make, uh, make payments, you talked you talked about payments methods, so I should be able to see the different payment methods, right? Okay. Yes. Any other thing? Receipts. Receipts, okay. So, um, let's say receive receipts. Okay. All right. To sign agreements. Sign agreements. Okay. To sign agreements, you should be able to work. Sign, maybe view the list, yeah? What that would be online, online signature or something like, like that. You could just sign online. Signature, dates. Sign online. Okay. All right. So, sorry, time. So this is how you break it down. So you can see that we start with epics, things that are large. I break down the epic into manageable stories. I'm breaking down those manageable stories into like features or things that should be able to be done to meet that story. Now, these lines are, are what we call dividers. Like if you finish this, you, it can go as much as possible. Now the question the team will now come is, okay, for let's say um mvp for my mvp my first minimum viable products what do i want to release to olumide to start using in the market what are the most hours that can go that that are like functional that can start and then once we start building we start releasing more versions so once i decide that or once you decide that you have to decide what your mvps are going to be we are going to have this divider to to divide so let's say this is my first release let's say this is my first release and then i keep breaking that down until i have so i can name this mvp so and then i keep breaking it down until i have stories at this point work has just started these items are not in my backlog yet these are just mapping the user stories. And you don't have to finish user story in a day. You don't have to finish it at once. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to know everything about the products. At this point, I know that for me to find the house, I have to search for the house. I don't even know the feature or the technology that I need to do to make me search for the house. Those are the things that will still come later. But now I have an idea what to do to be able to find the house. And we'll still work on breaking this down into further details. Is story mapping clear before I move on to the next tax? 
Yes. Oh, very, 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 very okay. Are we having fun? Very well. No. <laughs> I'm already feeling like a product manager. <laughs> easy, easy. <laughs> easy. All right. So now we've framed the journey. We've identified our product backlog. We've created the backbone. Now we need to build, we've also sized out the MVP. We need to build the body. Build the body is now for me to be able to say, okay, what am I starting on? Now this goes into for acronym is called deep now for every item on the backlog they have different level of i think i have a picture of a backlog. they have different let's use this item let's use this picture they have different level of detail so i, I don't expect that your product backlog should be detailed end to end if that happens you've gone back to the waterfall don't forget that waterfall methodology is where we plan end to end the only thing that needs to be detailed is the items on the top of my backlog, which are like the items that are in my first release that I'm ready to release, the items that are ready to go to, to get worked on. The rest will be still bulky. So let's say, I'm trying to find a relatable example. So I can't, I can't find one. But what it means is that you don't, your entire backlog doesn't have to be detailed, but the items at the top of your backlog are expected to be detailed. They're expected to be broken down, down to tax. So you have your epics, you have your stories, and then the stories are now further broken down into tax. And I've already mentioned that a tax should not, should be, the definition of a tax is an item that can be done by one person in maximum of 20 hours. Anything that is taking somebody to do in one week, that tax has not been broken down. It needs to be further broken down. So when your project manager is saying, after this time, I say it take me two weeks. And they're like, why is it taking two weeks? It's because that means we don't have clarity. We both don't have clarity on this tax. And so it's not even supposed to be in the sprint. Any tax that go into a sprint is a tax that, when we get the definition of ready, we'll talk about it, that is ready. And for a tax to be ready, it means that it's been broken down. We have clarity. It is ready to be worked on. We have clarity on what's supposed to be worked on. And I cannot pick it up. So when somebody say, eh, this thing we take is taking two weeks. No, the entire um, tax, so you can have 10 tags that will take two weeks, but each one should not take you more than 20 hours to do. That's the maximum. So you have two hours, five hours, it should not take maximum. I think some even say 18 hours. So the items at the top of your backlog should be detailed appropriately, meaning it has been broken down. So you can see how this image has been broken down. It should be estimated. We're going to talk about estimating story points. In Agile, we do not use hours. Like I said, 18 hours. We do not say uh, it should take 18 hours. We use story points. We'll talk about that. It should also be, imagine means that it's ready and it should be prioritized. So I think at the top of the backlog are prioritized, ready to be worked on. The ones at the bottom, they are still waiting for their turn. So we've not gotten there yet. So as soon as you finish, you move up. For every item that comes up, you make sure you use this acronym deep and then they are detailed. So now we are story points because what you also do is once you break down those stacks, don't forget that we have to break down for our presentation. We have to break down our user stories. And then for the first, MV, we have to slice out our first MVP. And for the first MVP, we have to break it down to tasks that should not take more than one person to finish in. 20 hours and then we have to assign time to it. Now for us to do our story point estimation in Scrum, we do not use hours. And the reason being is when items go into the backlog and it goes into a sprint, in a normal scenario, you do not assign tasks to developers. The developers are the ones that go into the sprint backlog. So don't forget that we have put up backlog. I've not picked out, I've we've done sprint planning. We've looked at the, the time, the tax, the items, the backlog. We've seen the ones that are ready. We've picked out, let's say four, and we've put it into the sprint goal for the next two weeks. Now, every day, the developers are supposed to go into that bucket and pick out tax until you empty out that tax and finish the sprint. So there is no 
as paint learning. Oh, you are supposed to do you're supposed to do this. And that's because it's scrum team is supposed to be self-organized. Like everybody's supposed to be able to do everything. And that is why we do not assign time because everybody in a scrum team has different level of expertise. So it's tax that can take someone with eight years experience to do in let's say two hours can take someone with three years experience to do in 10 hours. And because you don't know who would pick what, you don't want to assign time and then allow, making it look as if somebody doesn't know what they're doing or doing their job. So we use what we call story points and I will talk about story points. So a tax, no matter um, who is picking it, would have a story point assigned to it. A tax is a tax, the complexity of the tax is the complexity of the tax. This tax will take this story point, then anybody can pick it and work on it. Another thing is, you also don't want to encourage a situation of um, compete. You don't want to encourage a competitive situation within a scrum team. You don't want to say, oh, um, I keep, I finish my tax in two hours. You are still doing your own eight hours. Because everybody is supposed to be equal in a scrum team. So you don't want to um, have a situation of competition. So you, that's another reason why we don't use hours. And the last thing is, you also don't want people to not start over blows because when you leave it at you saying, how many hours will it take to finish this tax? I can over bloat the time to be able to go and do other things or, or whatnot. I can say it will take me 10 hours. We have to take one hour. So the entire team agree on the complexity of a tax and then it's dropped and picked. So a, a team, a scrum team is measured by story points and not hours. We don't use hours in scrum. There are different methods of doing story points. We have the t-shirt sizing where you assign a tax, small, medium, large, extra large. This is for maybe you don't have time to break goals so or you just want to stay high level. You don't have time to start breaking tax. It's not really advisable. It's mostly used by very, very experienced team. And that's because they already know what it would take to finish that tax. So they don't need to start breaking it down. We also have the, uh, it's called dog, so I can't remember, but it's used, the size, the different, size of dogs are used. So you have like from the Chihuahua to the Great Dane. So you have the Chihuahua, you have the Labrador, you have different sizes of dogs. Now on to also that because first of all, you have to start knowing what dog is, what size and everything. And then we have the most popular method, which uses the Fibonacci sequence. I don't know if you are familiar with the Fibonacci sequence. No, no. Okay. So uh, that one is for scientists. So anyway, the Fibonacci sequence is a, is a sequence of numbers where the previous number is uh, double in size to, to the previous one. So I think you have one, three, five, seven, nine. So it says it's a sequence of numbers and um, it's the most popular one. And what happens is you look at a story or how, or how complex it is and assign it a and assign it a number. So you have one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen. So you add the previous, if you want to add the previous number to make up the next number. So the next one here will be 21. And then you have so that's how it goes. So for and the name of the process is called planning poker. What happens is you have cards with the Fibonacci sequence. So you have card with one, two, three, five, like that. And then you have team members. So you pick up a, a card, a user story. Don't forget that our user story is in the shape of a card. And you have a moderator. The moderator can be the score master, anybody can be moderator. And all of you as agree, based on the complexity of that story, you assign a number to it. So everybody gets a card face down. And then when it's time to assign, you turn up your card. And then you do that repeatedly until you have like, like almost the same. So let's say I turn up my card and it says 13, and then every other person says one. You have to, don't forget that plan um, scrum principle says you have to, there's importance in communication. You have to allow the person to, there's no, uh -uh, this one is Ole, why are you using 13? No, you have to allow the person explain why they think that tax would should be assigned a, a point of 13. 
Sometimes they may have information that you don't know, or maybe they've done that project, that particular task somewhere else, and then there were some things they encountered, what they think. So once they give that feedback, you people use that feedback to think again and then assign number until you get an agreed number, and that becomes the points that's assigned to that story. This reason is because if you, as a project manager, if you've been in scenarios where you've told a project, a, a project team to say, ah, this tax is not small, it will take two days now. I'm telling you that tax will not come out until two weeks. But when you allow a developer to say, oh, based on this tax, I think it should take two days, they would commit to getting that thing out for you in two, in two days. So it's why you leave the estimation of a tax to the developers. They are responsible. And once they assign that time, they will commit to bringing that to you at the time that you've agreed. So developers are the one, when I mean developers, I keep saying, I'm not talking about the software engineer, I'm talking about development team, are the ones that estimate. The product owner has no say in this matter. The product owner can only negotiate and say, oh, guys, you know, we already promised that this feature will be out in days. Can we do, can only negotiate. The, the development team has the final say on how long it will take a tax to be delivered. Now, this is a cheat sheet that I've um, given to you guys um, for how you can assign points to a stories. So you have from what you know about the tax. Remember I said tax that you don't know anything about have no reason to be in your sprint. If they've not been broken down to be able to, for you, for you to be clear to everyone, then it needs to stay in the backlog. So any tax that is taking 13, so a story point of 13 means that it's going to take you more than one week. It is not ready to be in this space. You have to break it down into smaller items. So you have from what you know about the tax to what so you know, everything, something to nothing. You also have dependencies sometimes you pick a tax in the, into a sprint and there's a dependency like say, you need to deploy a version into the environment to be able to complete that tax. Or you need to, let's say, okay, let's use the most popular. You need to connect to an API to be able to surface that front end and the API is not ready. That tax has no business being in your sprint. For a tax to be in a sprint, it must not have no dependency you must be clear about what will it take to deliver the tax for it to be in a sprint. If it has dependencies, put it back in the backlog. And I also look at the work, the work effort. So once you're deciding where you're estimating this particular tax, how long based on our collective experience, you think it will take us to two hours, half a day, up to two days. And based on that, you assign the story points to it. So you're expected to assign story points to tax that's to your first MVP tax, okay? All right, are we still together? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. All right, so, so is there a question? No question. All right, All right so the um, last thing that we are going to do is definition of ready. So I've talked about Definition of ready. So there are two things we need to know: definition of ready and definition of done. Definition of ready is how do I know that a tax is ready to be put into the sprints? That's definition of ready. So only items that are ready in the backlog goes into a sprint. Definition of done is how do I know that this tax is done to be able to? So sometimes you you get assigned a tax and you say you're done, and the question is. How do I, if there's no transparent way for everybody to measure that that tax is done, then you're not using your scrum principles. Because you should be able to, based on a checklist agreed by a development team, should be able to say this tax is done. So the definition of done depends on the development team. So it can be after testing, it can be after release production, it can be after um I finish coding and deploy to to um to the repo. So it depends, but each team has to agree that definition of done, and then now we use that going forward. And everybody has to do that. So for definition of ready, we use what we call invest. One is that that um item is as a, a an ROI. Don't forget that I should be able to release incrementally 
a product to my customer that they can start using. So does that, um, if I release this particular thing, this is my sprint goal, um, does it meet that? Now, it's not at the end of every sprint that you should have a, a, a shippable product. Sometimes you can have um, a release. So let's say the house thing now, my first release should be that at the basic, people should be able to go to my website and then um, search for house, filter by price, um, search by location. And then once they click, they should be able to see pictures, they should be able to call the agents, do a fiscal inspection, make payment on the site and move in. That can be my first release. Of course, I won't be able to release that in two weeks sprints. Now, now look at, once I do my estimation, my total story points, I look at what's the, all this item in my MVP, what's the total story point based on the estimate I've done with my team. So let's say the story point is 200. Don't forget that in that story point, we'll have the, we'll have the 13s that are big. So you can have in your backlog story points that are 13, but it's just that it doesn't go into a sprint. So let's say I have all together 200 story points. And I look at my team, how many people are in my team? Four. What's the capacity, best case scenario? What's the velocity that my team can put out every, every sprint? So I calculate um, if I've done sprint before, how long does it take us to finish things in sprint? Or if I'm just starting, we'll use rough estimates. So let's say at a rough estimate, my team, my team velocity is 20, meaning those four guys can roll out items of aggregate of 20 story points every two weeks. So it means that my MVP has 200 story points and my team velocity is 20. My number of um, sprints to get to my MVP will now be the total story points divided by my team velocity, which is 200 by 20, and that will now be 10. So it means that I have to have 10 sprints to be able to release my first MVP to my customer, which is um, 10 times, which is 20 weeks. I hope I've not got too much lost. Can you repeat? Can you repeat? <laughs> I knew you guys were quiet. <laughs> okay, so I'll start it again. Once we've done, so I'll, let's go back to our story mapping. So once we've done our first MVP, this is this item is our first MVP, yeah? We'll now have our estimation based on what we have here. So how long do we think it will take us to do each of these items? And then we assign story points. So let's say search by search house we take Mm, maybe half a day, I'm just uh, so I fit up education will take maybe half a day. I assign a story point of one. Let's say payment method because I have to do integration, integrate to Flutterwave, integrate to Remita, integrate to Paystack, whatever. Maybe that would take me one week or two weeks. I assign a story point of 15. So I assign a story point to all this and then add everything together. The aggregate is the total story point I need to get to my first release, to ship my first product to the customer, to say, Olumide, start using this at the basic. This is my first version of release for you. So I'm saying, let's say after all those, we say our story point is 200. So 200 story points to release. Now I need to determine how long it will not take me. Don't forget, we don't use hours and time in Scrum. I need to know how long it will take me to complete this 200 story point to be able to get the first MVP to Olumide. So I come back to my team. I need to, what's the velocity of my team? So there are four guys in my team, four developers, awesome guys. So I'm saying, what's the maximum? What number of story points can four of you release in a sprint time box. A sprint time box, in this case, I'm using two weeks. Some companies use one week, some use two weeks, some use one month. I'm using two weeks for this example. To get this um, velocity, if this is a team that has worked with me before, all I can just do is do a chart. Previous sprints, how many story points was complete? So sprint one, they did uh, 15. Sprint two, they did 20, sprint three. 
and do an average of that and then i'll be able to know my team velocity for a new um this thing we can assume and um, that we can say eh, i believe that we can do this in we can do 10 or 15 um yet they say oh no i think we can do 20 and then we all agree on an average so let's say the team now agrees that in a sprint though for us, if we don't burn out, for us not to burn out, the number of story points that we can release in a sprint is 20. At our best, this is like average is 20. Of course, we can do more, but average we can do 20. So the product manager will now say, okay, I have 200 story points in my first MVP. My team's velocity is 20 story points per sprint. So it means that for me to be able to finish this MVP is going to be the total number of story points divided by my team velocity, which is 200 by 20. It means that I would need 10 sprint cycle to be able to release my first MVP. Now, if each sprint is two weeks, it means that my first MVP will be released in two times 10, 20 weeks. That's so that's a customer. Are we fine? Yeah, it's on that. Okay. Is everybody fine? Yes. yes. Okay. So another tax is we need to know when your first MVP will be ready. So you do that tax and it will say, okay, the first MVP will be ready in social number of weeks based on this calculation. Okay. And um, so, like I said, this is the vision of ready. Business value is clearly known. The details are understood. So the official already is now, after I've not done all this, this 20 that I now want to do this next two weeks, in this backlog, which one of these 20 story points can I put into the sprint? That's where you now start saying which item is ready. So the details have to be understood. The dependencies have been identified. There's no dependency that can block the PBI is product backlog items. From being completed, the team I have the team to do it. The um, item is estimated and small enough. There's no reason where an item that the story points is thirty. I'm not putting it. Thirty is like maybe three to four weeks. I'm not putting it in a two weeks time box. There's really no way I'll finish it. So the item has to be estimated and small enough to enter that sprint. The acceptance criteria for that item must be known. We have to agree. For me, also know that this is how you would know that I've delivered this item and it must be testable. So this is determined by the Scrum team. And then the definition of done, when I'm now done, how do we know that you are done? I've said um, every organization have their different ones. This is a suggestion. You can decide your own. So is that I finished the code, I finished the code, go to refactoring, I've commented, I've checked in, I've um, done everything, I've commented to repo, I've updated my release notes. The tester have tested it, there's no defects, and then I've deployed it on live. You can decide what is your definition of done that makes you say this tax is done and I can close it. And once you do that, think that's about it. Yeah, that's about it, yeah. So once you do that, you, tell me, you define your definition of ready and your definition of done. Don't forget that definition of ready is items in backlog that are ready to go into sprints. Why definition of done is items that go into the products that are shipping to your customer. So those are the two different. In final, the final thing I want to take off from this class is that Scrum is a team approach. There's no I in Scrum. There's no, I did my work, this person not do their work. There's really none of that. In some organizations, Scrum development teams are ready for firing team members. So we're ready for saying, oh, this team member is not performing, this team member is not doing optimally. You're also responsible for saying, okay, this team member needs also training. It's a self-organizing team in the real sense. And then it has strict rules, but if you follow the rules, you're fine. And it's also built on simplicity. There's nothing complex. Like if something is becoming complex, just something I know is in Scrum, it's supposed to make your life easy. And then it can be used in every context. And so that brings me to the end of my class. And thank you, everyone, for listening. I'll take questions. Thank you so much. Wow.
Thank you so much, um, Yetunde. So we'll just take just one question because again, um, you know, time is not really on us. So we'll just take one question. So if, please, if you have any question, kindly unmute and um, ask your question. Then for other people that have other questions, you can just drop it on the Discord channel and Yetunde will be able to address that for us. So please, just one question. If you have any question, kindly unmute and go ahead with your question. Okay, all right. So, so that means that um, we all understood we all understood the concept of project management. So thank you so much, Yetunde, for the expository teaching on project management. And to say apologies again for the glitches, we sincerely apologize for that. So again, as a DevOps practitioner, it's essential to understand the project you're working on, right? And that's why we've been able to take time to you know, understand what it is you know, when you are building your project, right? So the thing is, even if you are very skillful, even if at the end of the day, you know all the skills required to release your product to the target market, but, but you don't understand um, what that product, what, what that product itself is meant to address, you know, it's going to be chaos really, because we've seen some organizations, right? They just, you know, commence project. And then at the end of the day, you know, just like the project that ought to be finished in um, in how many months? Six months, right? It took like close like ten months. So it's very very important that as a DevOps practitioner, as a developer, you need to understand the project, and that is why we are taking our time to talk about product management. We're talking about agile, you know, talking about the waterfall model. Like we really need to stress on that very well. So there's a need to work incrementally and in tandem with your project manager to understand the requirements needed to produce a, a product. So Yetunde is our project manager, you know, where I work, and um, she's really doing a fantastic, she's really doing a fantastic job. If, if Yetunde, you know, tells us that this is, this thing is not going to life, there's nothing we can do about it, you know. You know, she has other project managers that actually work uh, we have, and I know the level of work that comes into, you know, planning a product because it's very, very essential and very important. And that was why I just had to pull her into this, you know, mentorship platform. Just come and share your experience, come and share your ideas with us. And you all will believe that, you know, the class has been very, very fantastic. So yesterday will still be with us on the Discord channel. So if you have any question, you can um, always, you know, um, post your question. So once again, thank you so much, Yetunde. So please, we are required to study the material that have been shared with you on the channel. And just like I've said, if you have any other question, you can drop it for Yetunde to address. So project management is usually a six-month course, you know, on its own. And Yetunde has able to summarize it for us, like in less than three hours, you know. In fact, at some point, I was I was careful that I hope Yetunde will not spend it. But it's, but it's cool, like, like I enjoyed, you know, the class and all of that. So um, again, we share the materials, you'll be required to discuss the material in your different teams. And then you have to nominate two people for presentation next week, Friday. So each person will use an average of five minutes, right? Someone is saying, is the Discord channel open to external participants? No, we, we have closed the channel, we actually, opened, we extended the channel for a week for people that didn't join. But right now, please will not accept any other, um, will not accept any other participants so that at least we can be able to um, it. So we won't open the channel again for um, participants. Thank you. Right. But if you have any other question, you can always send your mail to hello at that.ng and I'll, I'll be able to take it up from there. All right. So you would nominate two people for presentation next week, Friday. And then, you know, you would, you would, you've been grouped within the Discord channel. So please, I don't know how you want to, um, I don't know how you want to, you know, arrange the, the discussion itself. It could be maybe like WhatsApp call. It could be on Discord itself. So within Discord, you could also, you know, arrange meetings, you know, 
calls and all of that. But the most important thing is you need to collaborate, right? And it starts from now. So yeah, from now until next week, Thursday, to be able to discuss and come up with a product, just like yesterday, um, um, able to, you know, discuss. So like I've said, DevOps is a steep learning curve and we all need to collaborate and understand the product space because the truth, the truth is that, you know, Everything that Yitunde has discussed today is being used today. You know, talk about sprints, user story, backlogs, you know, project management, all of this, you know, we use it in my workplace. And as a DevOps engineer, you need to be familiar with all of these, you know, ideas so that once you once you start as a DevOps practitioner, you know, all of these concepts will not be strange to you. So we'll post some other videos on our on our on our Scott page, the links, you know, for you to better watch and um that's the idea of project management. So again, thank you so much, everybody, for joining in. Next week, we'll discuss more on agile methodology, right? So next week's class would not would not take much time, right? It should be just within an hour, and we'll be done with that. So next week, our faculty speaker is ready, Echezona Agubata, who is the head of of the head of um, projects management for Union Bank. So he would it will be here with us next week and he's going to talk about agile methodology again. So please let us let us take time to discuss in our different groups. And um, next week Friday we will all come together again to um, discuss as a group and then YouTube will be available to answer all the questions. So again, it's going to be two people per group, and each person has a minimum of five minutes. It means per group you have um, a minimum of less than ten minutes to be able to project and to um, talk about your idea and how you'll be able to structure all of this using the um, the Scrum methodology. All right. So I think that is it. Apologies for the glitches. Sorry for taking your time today. I believe subsequent classes definitely will be less than an hour. And then, you know, we can move into the sprint for the week. So I hope you all are excited. Can we get a recording? Yes. Um, yes, I would share the link of the recording on our YouTube page um, before the end of the day so that at least Zoom can um, process the recording and upload on our YouTube page. So thank you so much, everybody. I don't know if anybody has any other question. And just drop now so that we would, would address it now. So again, within your team, please, it's very important, you know, Yetunda has been talking about collaboration, you know, team planning, you know, coming together to discuss. So minimum or maximum, oh, okay, sorry, maximum of five minutes. I'm sorry, maximum of five minutes per person. Does each team have a coordinator? You have to decide who your coordinator is. Like, like you, you are all within the group. You guys need to decide who the coordinator is. You can just set up a temporary Zoom call, you know, include everybody in it, and you guys can actually discuss. So we don't have we don't have a say over who the the coordinator is. So you guys can just can we get the study material and current presentation? Sorry, Ianu, are you are you on our Discord page? Johnny, okay, you're on the, of course, yeah, we would we would drop the material and the current presentation. So you can get the current presentation slide on the materials channel on Discord. It's um, DevOps resources. So we'll drop it there. And you can also go to the DevOps resources channel. You'll find the um, the lecture notes, the principles of project management in software engineering is there for your consumption. So, right. Does anybody have any other question so that we can call it a day? Okay, again, thank you so much, Yetunde, and we would meet again next week, Friday. So the time will be communicated to everybody. So we'll meet again next week, Friday, so that at least we can can discuss more on everything. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.